Right, I should have started off saying to begin with, sorry, that I'm Jenny Neeks, I'm Deputy Chief Nurse, for those of you that don't know me. Um, and the reason that we're here today is that partly because um, I know Terry from previous lives in London and in Homerton and we've kept in touch before I moved up to Lincolnshire, but also I'm a bit of a Twitter fact fiend. Um, and one of the things that really sort of jumped out at me on Twitter quite a few months ago now was the Academy of Fabulous NHS Stuff, or NHS Fabulous Stuff, and I always get it the wrong way around, but if you Google it, you get there in the end. And as you know, the journey we've been on, the improvement journey we've been on, the whole drive from the board um, and from all of us here, and if you think about the, the essence of listening into action and the ULH way, has been about celebrating what we are doing that is fantastic to, to, you know, to take us forward to our strap line, which is beyond good. And when you look at the Academy of NHS Fab stuff, it does exactly that. It does what it says on, on the tin. It celebrates all the fabulous work that's going on uh, across the country. And so there were lots of sort of twittering backwards and forwards, and I was like, oh, this is fab, this is fab. And then we heard that Fab NHS were going on tour. So I'm going, hello, Lincolnshire calling. Never thinking we'd get them to come visit, and here they are today. So been out and about on a visit um, on the wards. Uh, a couple embarrassing moments for uh, Rochelle, we know is, uh, is a keen dancer and had a waltz on the ward with, uh, with, Terry, <laughs> with uh, Roy this morning. Um, and come away with some fabulous promises for some, for some more work. Um, but this session is called Roy and the Blonde, um, and, uh, and, and I was joking with uh, Terry a while ago that actually I thought that was a bit of a, you know how you hear about blonde jokes, I was thinking how do you let him go away with that, but I think they'll explain that relationship uh, a bit more than I do. So I'm going to hand over to Roy and the Blonde. Um, what I was going to ask Roy to do, but I'm not sure Barry and Mummy Ball just had lunch, but in, if we consider the dancing up on on 6A, what you didn't know is that Roy was actually a gold medal winner um, ballroom dancer in years gone by, <laughs> which I found out over coffee, and he shaved his chest and had a spray tan. <laughs> um, I, you, I'm, I so understand. Much for today. I know. I had, well, you know, you're in the media, so uh, you didn't say it was off the record. So, if any of you are brave enough later on to ask him to, pre you know, to see if that is uh, the real life, then we could probably ask him to do that. So, without um, uh, delay, let me hand you over to Roy and to Terry. Thank you very much. And give a round of applause. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for inviting us to come and see your fabulous hospital and all the fabulous things that you do. We, uh, we're on the road with the Academy of Fabulous Stuff. We started uh, the Academy of Fabulous Stuff as an antidote to the knobheads at the CQC. Uh, and, um, you know, it's cost us a fortune, but we think we're more popular than they are. And we've certainly done more to improve healthcare than they have. Um, the driving room, the engine room, uh, behind the Academy of Fabulous Stuff is the blonde, and so I don't think really, I'm going to talk for very much longer, I'm going to hand you over I think to the blonde, but before I do that, we just, I thought we all get ourselves in the right mood, would you all put your right hand up in the air please, your right hand up in the air fine, and uh, just lower it on the left knee of the person you're sitting next to, give it a little squeeze <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're feeling fabulous tonight <laughs> The guy here thinks it's Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> the chairman's having a broke back mountain moment. <laughs> anyway, ladies and gentlemen, it's the blonde! Thank you very much. Um, have those of you that maybe have uh, seen any of the Periscope uh, films of us know that this actually is an extremely rare moment that the blonde is allowed to get a word in Edgeworth. So I'm absolutely going to make the most of it. Um, hi. Um, and really blonde, people do say, what is a nice colorectal nurse like you doing knocking about with a reprobate like Roy Lilly? And why do you let him call you the blonde? So maybe before we start, I'll just explain that. We met on Twitter. We met um, mainly because Roy is quite an accomplished artist, although don't tell him I said that. Um, and I like to take a few snaps, and I would post some of the pictures I took of the metropolis where I live, Canary Wharf. 
And a few days later, some bloke called At Roy Lilly started drawing his interpretation of my pictures. And I'm like, who is this At Roy? Who, who is this copying my work? And I started to, at first I thought, oh, well, that's quite a compliment. And then I thought, well, he's not acknowledging that they're behind pictures. So I started to say, oh, was that my picture? My photograph? And oh, yes. My... Anyway, I, my job, uh, my day job is around uh, helping specialist nurses demonstrate their value. Because specialist nurses are expensive uh, when we're doing cuts to, you know, financial constraints. You're going to look at expensive band seven specialist nurses uh, to save money first. So we have, uh, I have a website called the Apollo Nursing Resource, which is all about how helping nurses show the really great things they do, the value that they bring to a hospital. And Roy actually saw... Uh, via my tweets about Apollo and in fact on a couple of his e-letters <coughs> wrote about the Apollo website and then said to me well actually this is very similar I talk about wanting to have an academy of fabulous stuff where NHS people can go and look for really great stuff that works and it seems to me you're doing that with Apollo specifically for specialist nurses can you help me make the academy of fab NHS stuff work and I, being a kind of can-do kind of blonde, said, yeah, of course, absolutely. And so we launched on February the 14th this year, Love Your NHS. A bit corny, but that's, uh, you know, that's how, we, that's how we roll. And we are totally overwhelmed, in actual fact, that we're here. It's an incredible privilege, um, and we're very humbled that people would want to share with us. Because in less than nine months, we've had uh, nearly 500 fabulous shares uploaded to the website. We have about one and a half thousand people a day log on to the website to look and search for, for fab stuff. So it's, it's grown beyond uh, all our uh, kind of um, dreams really at this stage. But to explain blonde, okay, you could consider that blonde is a derogatory kind of term, but actually I'm probably the least blonde blonde that Roy has, has ever met. But actually, blonde actually stands for the key things that Fab NHS stuff is all about. So B, the B in blonde. Any idea what that might be with regard to sharing great stuff? Brilliant. Yeah, anything else? It's a very technical term. Big it up. <laughs> Big up what you do. Okay? As particularly nurses, but other kind of caring professions. We dumb down the whole time what we do. Twice today we've had people describing to us fantastic initiatives. Oh, that's just what I do. There's no just about anything about what you do. Oh, it's basic care. It's fundamental care that, on which you build every other fabulous thing in this hospital. So, big up what you do. Use the Academy of NHS stuff <coughs> to big up the great things that you do. L. What, what might L mean in blonde? No? Long con. Long con? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like the... Some, <laughs> but it's actually little things matter. Okay? So people say to us, but what we're doing, it's not, you know, it's not a randomised controlled trial. I haven't got 12,000 patients and it's not double blind. It doesn't matter. If it's an issue here and you've solved a problem by doing a little thing, then little things matter. And it's aggregation of, what is it, Roy? Aggregation of minor, gains. of minor gains. So lots of little things put together make big things. Okay, so people are reticent to share because, oh, it's only a little thing. Big up the little things that you do. Boast about them because they're important. <coughs> oh... The O in blonde. Outstanding. Out. Oh, thank you. Referring to the blonde or to your yeah, work? No, it's you. Oh, <laughs> thank you. you thank got, you. You've got a fan to me. Oh, I had to work for the, that though, didn't I? Yeah, Roy was going to say older, but of course referring to him, not to me. What oh. else could the O stand for? It's a free opportunity. This is your opportunity to shine. Boast about the things that you do. Because do you, one and a half thousand people a day will look at your fab ideas. And they're not just the, the NHS people, but they're also 
important people. Simon Stevens is a huge supporter of Fab NHS stuff. He is fully aware each week of the Fab shares that go onto the homepage <laughs> each week. Use this as an opportunity to share with other healthcare professionals, but your community and your public will get to hear about it. It's an opportunity for you to dispel some of the negative connotations that might be associated in the past with this area. So it's an opportunity. N. Chicken nuggets. Chicken nuggets? <coughs> Close. Now. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Please don't let it be knowledge. <laughs> no, <laughs> definitely not knowledge. And actually, it's never. Never think that what you do isn't good enough. Never think that what you do every day isn't valuable and shouldn't be shared. Never ever underestimate the importance of what you do. Nurses, especially my, my colorectal colleagues here, have heard me say this a bit You make a difference to people's lives absolutely every day. You have that opportunity, never think that it's not important. Never think that the contribution that you make to this, to this trust isn't important. And again, use the Academy of Fab NHS stuff to, to amplify your voice and the fab things that you do. D. Dents. Dentist. with blonde. Dentist. Denim. Denim. Diner. Determined. Dustbin. Yeah. Determined. Yeah. You, you have worked with determination over a long period of time to actually dispel a lot of the negative uh, criticism or negative atmosphere around this hospital. You uh, are determined to succeed. Because you, know what, you want to be beyond great, which is fabulous. But the first thing we saw when we came in was this beyond great, which is good. beyond good. Beyond good. <laughs> beyond great. <laughs> <laughs> no, but great isn't great even better than good. Yeah, I think I don't like to get beyond yes, good, and we believe we can, but then we'll get great. Then you'll get great. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. I stand corrected, Chief Nurse. I apologise. <laughs> so be determined. Be, you can share. This afternoon, maybe at the marketplace, we're going to be have a computer. We could do some out live uploading. If I have the Wi-Fi, do you know what? I can either <laughs> even get into the admin part once you've shared and make it go live on the website this afternoon if you're prepared to share some uh, stuff that you're doing. And we'll actually put it on the homepage live this afternoon. So be determined. Continue to be determined because you're great. And E. What's E? Everything. Everything. Ectoplasm. 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 No, that's not a blonde word, Roy. Definitely not ectoplasm. Elastoplast. Elastoplast. Yeah. Energy. energy. Did you say energy? Yeah, you're right. Energy. By sharing, by collaborating with Fab NHS stuff, you're going to continue this huge positive energy that's happening here. Not just for you, but for other people who read your stories. And we have a responsibility to support each other. By, share, by sharing your great <coughs> stuff, you're going to be energising and really motivating other people. So, blonde, B. Big it up. Big it up. Yeah, it's very technical. Big it up. L. Little, little things matter. O. Opportunity. A. Never underestimate the importance of what you do. D. Perfect. Okay, well, that's. Uh, um, Roy's going like this. I've had my 1 minute 30 seconds. So I, w I will hand over now to uh, my partner in crime, Mr. Roy Lilly. You can see who runs the Academy of Fabulous Stuff. <coughs> Terry runs it and I run behind. Um, what I wanted to, oh, hi everybody. Oh, I can see myself then. <laughs> yeah, you have put on weight, Roy. Yeah, I did. Can we turn this off? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I cannot stand to look thin. Anyway, it's nice to see you. Um, what do I want to talk to you about? Well, look, I, I have a little acronym myself that I use only really because I've been on the dementia training course and it's the only way I can remember anything these days. But I talk about right management. 
the right way. It's not right, uh, it's R-I-T, right management. Now, I just want to run through some thoughts that, that I didn't share them with you. Uh, the, the R stands in right for right, stands for a reality check. I think we, we need to have a reality check about healthcare. You know, um, I, I, people find it amazing, but I was born before the NHS. No! And at this point, I allow the audience to gasp, <laughs> pause, and say, surely not, Roy. Surely. Let's, so let's do that again. You're a bit unreal. <laughs> I was born before the NHS. Oh, <laughs> great audience. Okay, now you. I was born before the NHS. Wife. Looks. <laughs> My dad was a window cleaner, my mum was a shop worker, my dad had to save up the equivalent of three weeks wages uh, in order to get a midwife to come in and deliver me. Now my mum had lost her first baby, so she was a woman at risk. There was no possibility that she would uh, go to hospital because my dad couldn't afford it. So we had a midwife, I don't think it was like a, even a proper midwife, came in and helped my mum. And on the 23rd of June 1946, along came Roy Lilly on a sweaty Sunday evening. My mum had been in labour for 12 hours, no gas, no air, and she said it was worth every minute. <laughs> what a wonderful woman. <laughs> but that was the way it was, and so then, on the 5th of July 1948, two years later, the then Labour government nationalised the existing infrastructure and the NHS was born. And it took off the shoulders of working people to worry about accident, illness, injury, maternity, all the things that blighted the lives of working people. It was a huge weight off their shoulders. And today we carry on with the work that we do in the NHS. We carry on in that tradition. We carry on with that political ideal of socialised medicine provided by the state. And we're very proud of it, or we should be, <coughs> rich or poor, young or old, drug addict or granny, whatever's wrong, we scoop you up, take you to hospital, fix you up, no questions asked, no one asks you to pay. We just, we're just there for everybody. And people say, you know, we want the NHS to change. People will stand on, on stages like this, in front of audiences like this, and say, well, the NHS has to change. And it's, you watch their body, they all do it. The NHS has to change, and they flex their knees when they do it. Now, that's body language. It's called anchoring, okay? Now, body language is really quite interesting. If, if you look at it, if someone says to you, yes, absolutely, the check's in the post, they scratch their ear, that's called a tick, and that means it's not in the post, they're lying. Body language, very interesting. So if, if a guy says to you, ladies, if a guy says to you, of course I love you. If both shoulders go up, it's okay. If he puts one shoulder up, of course I love you. Then he's, he's at it at the office. <laughs> it's all, it's all. It's, sorry, guys. The secret's out of the bag. It's body language. So when they say the NHS has to change, that's called anchoring. And people anchor when they speak if they're actually not sure about what they're talking about. They emphasise it with their body, thinking that by emphasising it, that you will think they know what they're talking about. So when people say, the NHS has to change, from what? To what? We have the most admired healthcare system in the world. I'm just back from Tehran last week. The one thing they wanted to ask me about was how they could run an NHS like we run our NHS. And when the sanctions come off, I'm going back and we're going to try and help them do it. So when people say NHS has to change, they stick their arse out when they talk, it's because they're talking out of their arse. Okay? <laughs> so what I'm doing now is I'm training, I'm grooming audiences all over the country. So if anyone ever says to you the NHS has to change, you shout how. Okay? So we're just going to rehearse that. The NHS has to change. How? No, louder than that. The NHS has to change. How? Okay, good, I want you to frown this shit out of you. <laughs> frighten this shit out of them because none of them really know. They talk a lot of crap about the future of the NHS. But we do have to... <laughs> a bit late, but it was welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Every contribution. It's the delayed satellite link. <laughs> I'm sorry you're in California. I know 5,000 miles of roads and only 25 miles of dual carriageway. I've had it. I've had it. <laughs> So the, the NHS has got to change, well I don't think it's going to, but we do have to have a reality check because when the NHS was first born, the average working man lived until he was 68 years old, to these days it's 78.6 uh, years, so I've got 8.6 years left, I'm going to use every one up with enthusiasm, and on top of that, the average working man went home 
for his lunch. The average man, working man went home for his lunch. Can you imagine that? That was the kind of life that it was. And at that time, of course, we went into hospital. We lived and died in hospital. And most people died in hospital or at home. A lot of people died at home. And it was a very different world. The reality check is that now, if you look at your hospital, tonight I think you've got nearly 100 people in your hospital that you can't discharge. They will all be over, most of them I think over 70, many of them will live into their 80s and their 90s. God bless them and it's a good thing, but they will have multiple morbidities, all, kind of, all kinds of things uh, wrong with them in a way that we never envisage. So if we were going to design the NHS today, we would design it in a very different way because our customers, if I can put it like that, our customers in 1948 were a very different cohort of people to the customers that we've got now. And here you are with a hospital that was really hasn't changed very much in the original concept and design since 1948, trying to struggle actually with the 1998, 2008 problems, which are really quite different. And so when we have a reality check, it is obvious, isn't it, that we're going to have to re change, reconfigure how we approach our healthcare. And there is no better example of that, I think, than, uh, who, what was the name of that footballer who had a heart attack on the pitch? Fabrice Moamba. Moamba, Fabrice Moamba, yeah. I've met him, he's a really lovely guy, he's just had a baby of his own. Now this guy decided to have a heart attack, he had a heart attack in the middle of a Premier game of football. Now, if you are going to have a heart attack, it's as well to choose where you're going to have your heart attack. It's important where you have it. Now, where I live in Camberley in Surrey, we have the largest Marks and Spencers in the world. Okay, it's huge. Now, most of the ladies that work there, the shop floor staff, are ex-nurses. Because Marks and Spencers really value their staff and they pay them decent wages. Unlike the NHS. So you've got a lot of, you've got a lot of experts who are working in Marks and Spencer. And on the wall in Marks and Spencer, they've got these big yellow things, the defibrillators. You know, no one knows how to work them, but they've got them. So if I'm going to have a heart attack, I'm going to have it at Marks and Spencer's in Capital. Because we've got well-trained staff and the equipment. And if I don't like it, I can take it back. <laughs> so, what it, Fabrice decided to have his, his heart attack. There were 80 minutes resuscitating. He died eight times. They took him off in an ambulance. The crowd rose to their feet and applauded them. And they took him off in an ambulance. Okay, they took him off in an ambulance. What did they do? They drove past two A&Es and took him to the cardiac unit in North London. Took him to the cardiac unit. Why did they do that? Well, because they'd learned the trick. Why are you late? I'm going to have to start. <laughs> Listen, the ambulance can do it in eight minutes, so can you, right? <laughs> well, actually, no, the ambulance can't do it. <laughs> Sorry, boys. Right. So why does that work? Well, it's because we change the way we're thinking about how we look after our patients. So what, what we don't do, I mean, I, I tell you what really pisses me off more than anything, is if you go to a conference and someone stands up at a conference and says, at, at a lecture, just like this, don't say, I'm going to share with you today our community bunion service, <laughs> which is a really, really, really preparation for August, and everybody's bumped into this, and I'm going to show you my slides. <laughs> and on the, what do they do? They put up a slide of a patient in the middle, and they put a donut around the outside of all the services that are involved, and it's the famous donut slide. <laughs> we vote right now. If you ever see anybody give a lecture with a donut slide, get up out of your seat, step forward, and stab. <laughs> because it's not murder, no, it's called culling. <laughs> it's getting rid of stinking thinking. We don't want that, okay? Because if we take our existing services and we wrap them around our patients, we don't change anything. We kid ourselves we've changed them because we've changed the diagram, but we haven't changed the services. If we were going to have a look after Fabrice Mahumba with the famous donut, we'd have driven him into A&E, looked after him in 3 hours and 59 minutes and said, Result! He would be dead by now. 
What we did was we started with a patient and we worked backwards. We started with a patient and said, if you had a heart attack, what would you really want? I'd want to be seen by the best cardiologist there is immediately. What would you want? I want thrombolytics. I want a highly trained paramedics. I want all the things I want and you just start with the patient and you work backwards. And if you see anyone with a donut slide, <laughs> I suspect you have. <laughs> <laughs> Who's got a donut slide in their rack? Right? I'm going to kill you. <laughs> Start with the patient and work back. So what have we got? We got a hospital that's full of 100 and whatever it is elderly people. What do we do? We, they, have a, they have a dizzy spell. They fall over. The neighbour rings 999. They bring them in here and we see them in 3 hours, 49 minutes, 59 minutes and it's a result. No, it isn't. Start with your patient and work back. Why don't we have a silver service for our elderly patients? They don't go to A&E. They go to where there's a geriatrician who sees them in 20 minutes and social services see them in four hours and their exit is planned on the day they arrive. Start with the patient and work back. Forget the donuts. Start with the patient and work back. <coughs> it's a reality check. Doing what we're doing better than we're doing it probably won't do. Because of the pressures that there are and what's changed. We have to think different about how we deliver our services. We have to have a reality check, which leads me to the I in right. International. I am really a big fan of looking at what happens overseas in other countries. <clears throat> it, it, it's, uh, I used to run an international company. I learned a lot. We really ought to be doing much more of that. Looking overseas at other places <laughs> to see how they deliver services. Now, I was in Holland and I looked at a service that's run by Burtzog. Now, if you're interested in community services, you should look them up. Burtzog, it's B-W-R-T-Z-O-G. You're nodding at the back. It looks like you know about Burtzog. Do you want to come and do this bit? I can sit down. <laughs> Burtzog, right. But who are Burtzog? Well, they're actually a company in Holland. Now, don't be put off by the fact it's a company because that's the way they have their health services arranged in that country. But what it is, it's district nurses. Have we got any district nurses here? I suspect not. No? Okay. Good, I can slag them off. Right. Um, <laughs> we can, no. There <laughs> was one in the bar. Hang on a minute. No, I'm not. My daughter is one. Oh, shit. Yeah. Right, okay. <laughs> right, I'll just talk to this side. <laughs> the district nurses, they've got a really interesting take on district nurses that I'm sure your daughter would be interested to see. What they, what they say is, well, how do we do it here? Elderly person at home. How many knocks on the door does it take in a day to look after an old lady? Rising services, bathing services, chiropody, meals on wheels, afternoon, linen services, um, uh, shopping, uh, cleaning, you know. How many knocks on the door do we have when we look after an elderly person? Do you know what do? They have highly trained what we would call district nurses. The district nurses are prescribing nurses. They're tissue viability trained. They do simple hairdressing. They do chiropody. They do... Uh, they do everything, and they, oh, the, the two bits I wanted to get to is they do cleaning and shopping. So you have one highly skilled person looking after one patient. You put your best people in first. And that's how you keep people out of hospital. It's really interesting. If you have a look, have you got any physiotherapists here? Yeah. Physiotherapy. Do you know about physiotherapy in Canada? Not a great deal, no. But it's, it's different, isn't it? It, it is it's different. It's really it's insurance based. Yeah, uh, well, no, but it's, it's a holistic base. It's, so whereas here you would concentrate on looking after the limb that is damaged, injured, whatever, post operative, whatever, they have a much more interesting holistic approach to the whole of physiotherapy. They, they treat the whole body rather than just the, the bit that's. No. You know, it's, and we do in this country. Well, okay, fine, but I. Like or in this hospital. Well, I'm sorry, go. Well, this hospital is an exception. Which is <laughs> <laughs> you can never find anywhere that does anything bad. But it is interesting. You go overseas and you you see how things are done differently. Why is Mount Vernon Hospital the best paediatric hospital in the world? Why is it? I don't know. But I want to go and find out. And that's why next year we're starting the Academy of Fabulous International stuff so that we can share things internationally, because I think it's really important to see what they do in other countries. Right, T. What's the word, what's my word T? What does that stand for? Well, it's a word I don't use very often, 
but I'm going to use it today. It's tenderness. It's tenderness. It's how we look after each other. I'm a great believer if you, uh, if you protect the front line, fund it properly and make it fun to work there, your problems disappear. All of the problems that hospitals have come from the front line. That's where the complaints come from. That's where the poor, the, the poor care comes from. Where the front line is under pressure and it can't do the job that it's paid to in the way that it wants to do it, that's when you have the problem. Circle the wagons. Protect the front line. Fund it properly. Make it fun to work. I've never really understood why it is that we drive people balmy with things like whistleblowing. I don't understand why managers in hospitals don't crawl on their bended knees from one end of the hospital to the other asking people, what do I need to know? Why wouldn't you want to know? I've never understood why we make such a mess of complaints. And I know that you've had real problems with the complaints, but I met your pals ladies this morning, and boy, are they making changes to it. And you should be very proud of them, the way they address the complaints. Complaints is simple. Someone wants to complain, you listen. You sympathise. You don't justify. You make notes. You agree a course of action and follow through. Six simple steps in handling complaints that seem to be beyond the majority <coughs> of hospitals that I visit. It's a very simple <coughs> thing to do. But we don't do it. Safe staffing. I've never understood nice guidance. What is the point of guidance that says, well, we think one in eight might be safe, but is it, if it isn't, wave a red flag. <laughs> red flag guidance. What knobhead? Dream that. <laughs> Somebody who obviously hasn't been on a ward on a Sunday afternoon <coughs> in a missions ward when two dementing old ladies turn up and you're in, the middle of, you're in the middle of a drugs round and there's only one to eight, there's 36 patients and there's mayhem. I'm waving a red flag. Oh, really? <laughs> well, I hope you don't wear your wrist out. <laughs> Where are we supposed to get more staff at four o'clock on a Sunday afternoon? Never mind in the middle of the night. In California, well, it's different. Let me ask you a question. Who's been on a holiday this year? On a plane. Who's been on a plane? Yes, as you said, physiotherapists, plenty of money. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and as you sat back on the leather seats and drank a glass of something bubbly, while the rest of us were doing speedy boarding, <laughs> you relaxed in the knowledge that the steward to passenger ratio was prescribed in law. How many of you got kids? Okay. Leave your kids in the creche. The care assistants, the kids, prescribed in law. Who goes to the football? <coughs> you haven't got a football team, there, have you? <laughs> <laughs> who goes? Ha <laughs> ha! Bring it on! Come on! <laughs> Who's got, who's, who goes to football here? Who wants to a business? <coughs> right. Go to a football. <laughs> You go to a football match, the steward to spectator ratio is prescribed in law. Put your granny on a ward in the hospital and the nurse to patient ratio is prescribed in the finance department. Oh, but not here. We don't do that, can we? <laughs> you know? In California, it's the law. Nurse patient ratios, it's the law. New Zealand, it's the law. <coughs> And in America, where it's not the law, they have staff councils, where the staff decide on what the ratios will be and mandate the board to deliver them. Now, that's tough. It's tough in our environment, but if, we, if we, all we're here for is to look after our customer, look after our patients, you can't do that unless you look after your staff. You can't have happy customers unless you've got happy staff. You certainly can't have happy patients unless you've got happy staff. The pressures on the front line translate into the pressures on the, on the patient. And you see, and you know, uh, what else we got? Lorry drivers can't drive a lorry for more than nine hours a day. Do you know that? Did you know that airline pilots can't fly for more than a thousand hours a year? Did you know that a nurse can do three back-to-back -back 12 hours and then go and work in a care home for the other two days? I wouldn't have that. That's not right. It's not safe. And it's not good for the staff. Tenderness. You have to think about the staff. Protect the front line. Fund it properly. Make it fun to work with. E. E for me. Your E was what? Energy. Energy. 
My E is excitement. Only because you told me I couldn't have that one. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to give way, Terry. <laughs> excitement. Do you know, I, I have never, I've been in the NHS since 1974, I have never seen a time tougher than it is now. I've never seen organisations under more stress than their own. Three quarters of hospitals are effectively broke. Two thirds of hospitals are being mauled and messed about by the dickheads from the CQC. Oh, all they do is bring misery, mayhem and demotivation. You're trying very hard to recruit people. Well, let's go and work in a hospital in special measures, shall we? I don't think so. I'll work somewhere else. <coughs> but it's exciting. It's exciting because you could come to work and coast. You could come to work and jog along. Or you could come to work and say, do you know what? We've got no place else to go but up. We can only get better. And the exciting thing about that is that I think now we've got a young boy, Simon Stevens, who's the chief executive of the NHS. Very early in his career, he was taught by a very wise, articulate <coughs> lecturer when he was a management trainee. And unfortunately, modesty prevents me from telling you who it was. <laughs> <laughs> so his mind has already been twisted. He's a great chief executive. He gets it. He understands we've got to free the system up. We know that you can't survive here in this area with three hospitals and warring CCGs. We know that the population-based, capitated, budget, vertically integrated care solution for here is dying to be done. It's crying out for it. It's, the geography is right. The demographics is dying for it. The people want to do it. This is a very exciting place to be, and I'm sure it doesn't feel like it at times. <laughs> But it is an exciting place to be. And we've seen, Terry and I have seen fantastic stuff today. Little things that if we did them in every hospital throughout the UK, or throughout England at least, it would transform services for people. Don't underestimate that small things aggregated together and shared across the whole of the service matter. It does matter. The small things matter much more than the big things. Little things, Roy, get it right, please. You know what I mean. That was the voice of God. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew God was a woman? <laughs> it's the little things. Put them together, you get the big things that change. So as much as you're being challenged here, and I can see that you're overcoming a lot of them, I can sense the enthusiasm there is when somebody came along and criticised you, I bet you did a collective up yours. We are not that <laughs> trust. You are not that trust. Ignore them. If you come to work, enthusiasm, come to work, do the right thing, going home knowing you've done the right thing, that's all you've got to do. That's all you've got to do. So I am... Thrilled to have been here today to see the fantastic stuff you're doing. We've got some more to see this afternoon. Thank you very much for inviting us. Listen, don't beat yourselves up. I go to a lot of hospitals and I can smell a good one when I get out of the cab. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, who's your estates guy? You know, your estates guy. Your estates guy is fantastic. This this estate is manicured. It's fantastic. Now, I'm sure you only did it because I came, but, uh, yeah. but it, the estate, and you look around the building, you've got the architect's design guide from about 1940, haven't you? Every different type of building. Yeah, I'll tell you, your estates manager must have done something really bad in a previous life to end up with a job like that. But it's immaculate. And, uh, you know, I've seen the patches and the lino and all the rest of it, and I can see absolutely that someone is busting a gut. To say, you know what, we've got no money, but we've got lots of enthusiasm, initiative and ideas, and we are not going to let this place fall into disrepair. And you should be very proud of each other with what you've achieved. So what I want you to do, I want you all to stand up for me. Will you stand up, please? Stand up. I want you to face that way. Face that way and give the person in front of you a pat on the back. <laughs> Bloody well done. <laughs> say, stay standing, please. Stay standing. Why don't you stay standing because um, Terry and I speak to a lot of audiences 
And uh, I don't let her speak very often, that is true, because she just gobs on. But <laughs> she's never had a standing ovation. <laughs>
an interim company that charged the earth and they'll say, well, I'll come in for three months and try and do a turnaround. They come in, they chain through everything in the air, then somebody else comes in and suddenly you get this train where you don't get a permanent chief executive. Now, Jan is a good guy. Look after him, support him, make him feel welcome because this is his natural home and I think he will stay. In fact, I'm pretty sure that's his intention to see the rest of his time in the NHS out here. And the best hospital in the country is Frimley Park Hospital, where the chief executive has been there for 30 years. The best London teaching hospital, UCLH, Bob Naylor, been there for 28 years. R Len Fennick up in Newcastle, been there since <coughs> Florence Nightingale used to come to work on a bus. <laughs> He's been there forever, since it was a Nissen hut. Uh, and it's continuity matters. Continuity at the top is really very important. So you all decide where you're going, what the direction is, you all get in step and you go together because you won't do this unless you work together. So they go because there's just horrible, horrible pressures. And, and instead of supporting people and helping people, we just turn up and criticise them. And we've been inspecting hospitals now for 16 years and we've still got two-thirds of our hospitals who've got quality problems. So... Do you think it's either a quality problem or a system problem? I think it's a system problem. And we can inspect until we're blue in the face. We spend £200 million a year inspecting hospitals. <coughs> do you think that you could have that, a bit of that £200 million to ease some of your problems here? I do. And do you think you can improve your best practice by sharing best practice with other people? I do. Do you think we're wasting our money with the CQC? I do. Which is why I put my money into setting up the Academy of Fabulous Stuff. We don't get any funding. We pay for it. Because we care about the NHS and because I know in the longer run my investment will pay off. Because you're doing It's not just that, Roy. It's the right thing to do. Yes. It's the right thing to do is share and help each other. So I'm sorry to give you a polemic as an answer, <laughs> but you just touched my go button. <laughs> okay, can you, can you take your finger off the button? <laughs> I could press some more, but Oh, I'll... please don't. <laughs> I've got a train journey home. I'm going to get all of this, aren't I? Come on, mix that. Is that it? Right. Okay, let me ask you a question. Yes, just something. What are you going to tweet about us tonight? What I'm going to tweet about, I do, what we tweeted, we've actually, if you get home tonight, we've hashtag, what was the hashtag? There's no hashtag, but it's about the, <coughs> the hospital, so UL... Yeah, if you follow um, nice pictures, NHS, you'll see that we photographed. Dancing queen. We've been dancing on the walls. We've we've had the the, the, the naughty knitters. What do they do? They're, they're making g strings or something. Yeah. I don't know the naughty knitters. Uh, we've met we've met some fantastic people. A and E. I don't know what the fuss is about. It's very quiet when I was in A and E. You can sell half of it. You can sell. <laughs> He said to me, will you stay? And he said, you're lucky. I was asked to put scrubs on this morning. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so we will be tweeting that we met some fantastic people and they got some great ideas and they've shared some terrific stuff with us. We're, 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 I call it as I see it, you know. And what I've seen, I'm, I'm going to go home with a goosebump. You should be proud of yourself. Those of you who are on Twitter, you need to get on Twitter tonight because you miss it all. Yes, sir. You're the patient representative. I am. And well, you know, the, very the, busy one. the NHS will be so much better if you didn't come and did your bloody trivial illnesses and bugger. <laughs> 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 <That's quite laughs> Don't you? Oh, I'm not patient focused now. <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> well, being a shy retiring guy like you, I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> what, what I would like to say yeah. is at the moment, in Lincolnshire, we've got more than one NHS, yeah. as has every region. I don't understand, for the life of me, why. Why we've got the acute hospitals under one ULHT. We've also got the Lincolnshire Community Health Service, which operates other hospitals, the non-acute side. They also deal with all the community side, which is where our... 100 patients have to rely on. Why the hell is one lot run by a council that can't fix the holes in the road? Um, okay, right. And why, why, why isn't it? Why well, doesn't it all come under, I, say, Lincolnshire? NHS. Well, you're talking about you're talking about Devo. Right. Okay, I get the question. We, we're talking about Devo, really. Devo. Are you all familiar with Devo Mank? 
Manchester, they've, they've bashed everything together and we, nobody's really sure what's going to happen, but it, it, it kind of feels like it's a good idea. I don't all, know. All, all they did was improve the communication and kept yeah. the separate kept the organisations. Yeah. You need one structure. I agree. On now, strategy. I mean, if... if, if uh, well, firstly, I think the NHS is missing a strategic overview. I never thought I'd hear myself say it, but I think we do miss the strategic health authorities because uh, I think they were able to corral and, and, and pull everything together. We don't have that now. It's disaggregated and it's shared leadership. <coughs> Secondly, I think that there is an urgent need now to deal with the social service and the NHS interface uh, because of the things that we discussed earlier. Our customer profile, i.e. a lot of older people are coming through the system now, that we are not designed to deal with. And you're absolutely right. It, these are often social care issues on the way in and certainly social care issues on the way out. Merging health and social care, as they have done, I think, in, uh, in the Isle of Man, they've done it. Um, and in Northern Ireland, they work very closely together as well. When I was over there, I saw that. Merging health and social care is a no-brainer. But... They're both short of money, so putting two, two turkeys don't make an eagle, right? So it doesn't solve the problem. But by putting the two together, you lose the service interfaces, and that's where patients trip over, and that's where the money goes down the cracks. Why, why don't we do it? Well, i tell you why we don't do it, because social care is means-tested, and health care isn't means-tested. So the, the political fear is if you put the two together, what becomes means-tested? Health and social care means tested, that's too much of an ask. Health and social care not means tested, just free at the point of need, there's not enough money in social care. The stumbling block is the politics. The management aspects of this are very simple. So what happens? Well, I think the way out of it, without a political change, is to go for a population-based capitated budget for the whole area, where social services come in and the budget is pledged in the same way that the health service budget is pledged. Now, it can be done, and you need to look out for some of the uh, vanguards, and we have a page on vanguards, because we're big fans of vanguards. We feature a lot of the vanguard staff. Have a look at what some of the vanguards are doing. Now, maybe this time around, applying for vanguard status, you weren't ready for it because you've got other preoccupations. But I think drawing together everyone and saying, look, we, this, we can't carry on like this. The CCGs are never going to stop round with each other. We've got uh, all kinds of geography problems and duplication in the system. We need to draw this together as one vanguard for the area. Um, we have vertically integrated, population-based, capitated budgets, vertically integrated care. And that makes a lot of sense because what we've got at the moment is Marks and Spencers. You go into Marks and buy a shirt, but you've got to go down the road to buy a tie. It's crazy. So, but the way out, there is a way out. And the way out is vanguard status. And I would urge you, because I think you're ready for that. I think you've overcome the shock of Keogh. I, I sense there's a huge wave of enthusiasm with a lot of connected people who want to do the right thing. Have a look at vanguard. Push your board into being a vanguard. Make the outgoing chairman make a pledge to say that his legacy will be <laughs> vanguard status. And don't let him out of the room until he does it. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, a, I'm aware of time and, and we've got a fabulous, fabulous stalls out there in the marketplace um, and also you have got a train to catch later yes. this afternoon. So um, Roy is going to be, Roy and Terry are going to be here with us going around and I know many of you in here are running the stalls as well. So please, if you're not running a stall, please still go out and have a look. There's some amazing, fabulous things going on out there. And um, cake. And cake. And lots of cake. Actually, no probably, donuts. And cake. probably too much <laughs> cake, so um, please go for cake. But a huge round of applause. Oh, please. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The man with the legs, the least you could have done was waxed. <laughs> I had to. <laughs> Only men wax. Fabulous, thank you everyone. <laughs> 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 See? Yeah.